Welcome to the Functional Health Coaching Show, where we are here to support and answer your questions so that you can help people on a deeper level get real results and grow your health coaching business. Do you have questions you want to ask live on the show? You can call in every Friday at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 1-347-637-1378. Are you looking to increase your credibility and grow your health coaching business using functional lab testing and data-driven protocols so that you can confidently solve health issues? Well, we have the course for you. Go to fdn.today slash show to learn more and sign up today. Okay, let's join today's episode. Happy Friday, guys. Thanks again for spending an hour with us on your Friday afternoon or whatever day you're listening to this recording if you're not listening live. This is the Functional Health Coaching Show by FDN, Functional Diagnostic Nutrition. And I'm one of your hosts, Brandon Mole, FDN practitioner and clinical advisor and mentor. And they got my buddy, and he does similar things to me. And we just love FDN. Mm -hmm. That's Ryan Monahan. So we're going to be here answering your questions today. Um, And we've got some written-in ones. We've got some um, callers I see lining up there. I'm sure you guys will have some calls and some questions for us. So it is a live call. If you guys want to jump on and ask a question or make a comment, add to the discussion, we like that very much. Uh, number to do that is 347-637-1378. Again, dial 347-637-1378. Hit 1 on your keypad, and that will notify me that you want to come on, and I'll call out your area code, get your name, and you're welcome to ask a question or two. And uh, we're just happy to help support you whatever, wherever you're at with this. If you're already a certified practitioner, need some help with a case or something maybe involved with, with business potentially, um, or a trainee moving through the course or somebody just looking to take this course, uh, we like to answer questions, uh, a wide variety. So we're, we're kind of ready for it, anything each week. Um, and it is October 16th, 2020, so we'll get this on the recording. This is the, the date. Um, by this time next week, uh, we'll be in the middle of, the start of, um, the FTN conference. So, a uh, virtual conference. Uh, fortunately, um, Ryan and I are both be able to make it out there to help a little bit there in person. So, we'll get to still see each other, but not all of you guys, unfortunately, as it's going to be virtual. But I think the experience is going to be uh, coming close to, to something in person. Um, so, we won't have a Friday call next Friday, the 23rd because we'll be in the midst of the conference, so we'll take off, we'll take off that day. But uh, you'll get to see us instead. So we're going to be, I know Ryan and I are going to be in diff- different things and supporting and doing some mentoring sessions and popping in and out of rooms and things like that. So you definitely will, will see us around uh, during the conference, along with a whole host of amazing other people uh, with our staff. Uh, Reed, of course, lots of speakers, lots of uh, amazing folks there doing different workshops and, and of course, just doing uh, presentations just in general. Uh, along with vendors and our lab partners and supplement companies and all the people that you probably know pretty well, and lots of opportunity to interact one-on-one with people uh, or in a smaller group setting. So um, it's not going to be just like a webinar, like you're sitting just watching somebody talk. It's going to be way more interactive than that. So uh, next week, uh, that's what we'll be doing. So again, no Friday call on the 23rd, as we'll be we'll be in California or talking to you guys virtually. So it's going to be pretty cool. Uh, Ryan and I were just talking about some of the things we want to try to accomplish and do outside of the, the conference. Um, I mean, mostly nature and beaches and sunshine, so <laughs> that's uh, part of our goal, too, to recharge a little bit, too, uh, while, we're, while we're out west. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to it every year. It's a little bit of a working vacation for me every year. I try to have there some fun, but also, you know, make sure I'm very involved in the conference, but... Uh, the weather in San Diego is, is beautiful year-round, so I'm looking forward to being there in person and also just kind of uh, enjoying the, the shoreline as well. True, true. Yep. All right. Well, great. So that's coming up. Um, I, as far as I know, Ryan, correct me, but I don't think it's too late right now to, to get tickets for the conference if you still wanted to go um, and be part of the virtual conference. That's as far as I know, I haven't checked. Uh, probably should do that each time. But uh, we we'll probably have some kind of good, uh, good incentive going on for you guys still to come on and and uh, be part of it. Again, no matter if you're just looking at at taking this course, or you're in training right now, or you know you've been an FTM practitioner for years, um, you're always going to get something um, out of the course, um, a lot out of it. So, 
um, ftnconference.com is that website there, or check your email. We've got some announcements and things always going on about that. All right, let's mm-hmm. see. Um, I've got four graduates here. We do want to congratulate on air here today, and then, Ryan, maybe I'll give you uh, four there for any kind of updates for AFDNP or anything else I think we need to, to maybe know about before we launch into some questions. Um, so we have four graduates here um, this week, and um, let's see, we're staying in the U.S. Uh, this week. Um, so let's see, yeah, these four uh, ladies have done a great job here uh, with the course, and I enjoyed good, getting to know uh, most of them. Um, Shannon's been helping me out quite a bit with verbal finals, so we're kind of splitting those right now, um, just because we've just got a big, uh, a good thing, a big bubble of people wanting to, to finish up the course and get out there and do that. So thanks for your patience and booking. There might be a few days later than you had um, ideally wanted, but we're we're moving schedules around and trying to accommodate everybody. So thanks for your patience on that. And if you are patient, then your patience will pay off because you'll get to have your name read off on a Friday call as a graduate. So we we'll say congratulations to these four ladies here this week. We've got Abigail Steed from Wisconsin, uh, Melanie Dennison from South Carolina, Nina Tabak from California, and then Caitlin Rowan from Arizona. So, ladies, good job. Congratulations. Proud to have you as practitioners. <laughs> There's some awesome. more people out there ready to make a change in some people's lives. Super cool. And it's it's exponential. Oh yes. You know, I yes, was just, the ripple just effect. thinking about this, this, this the, the ripple effect, right? Yeah, you know, you change one client's life, but it's not gonna just change their life, it's gonna change the life of their family. You know, and many clients uh, might even go on to wanna be become interested in becoming FDNs themselves. I've seen that a number of times and or help mm-hmm. to use that information to help their significant others or their friends or family. So, you know, we, we have a pretty far reaching impact on the world as FDNs and the work that we do and, you know, helping clients and, you know, it may take one person at a time, but we, we are part of this sea change, right. In this, in this revolution and, and uh, the way that we think about, um, self-care and the way that we think about health. Mm-hmm. I don't think we say it as often as we used to, but the mission of FDN is to educate as many people as possible how to get well and stay well naturally, so they in turn may educate others. So that's exactly it. It's the multiplication of this awesome system that we have that changes changes lives. So it's working just like it should, which I'm very glad about that and proud to be part of that mission. All right. Couldn't Let's be more see. Proud um, yes. <laughs> All right. Ryan, and the conference is a big thing, so I don't know if there's anything else that uh, AFTMP-wise we need to know about or be made aware of that you, you know. No, no big updates other than, you know, as I say every week, that AFTMP is the place to be if you want to up your FDN game in terms of the ongoing professional support and clinical support. And I'm enjoying being in there every day, helping answer clinical questions. And Jennifer Woodward is doing an amazing job. I think she's an, an amazing AFDNP director. And she's constantly delivering the goods and the content for the group. There have been some really great Dress for Health Success Pro Series videos, to the past couple of weeks, too. I've just been really impressed with the the content that's being delivered. There was uh, We had Dr. William Shaw on talking about using the organic acid test to identify mold patterns and to look at mold toxins um, and, and how you might be able to see that kind of pattern on the test. Dr. William Shaw literally invented the organic acid test, so, so it was an honor to have him on. Mm-hmm. And then just mm-hmm. a couple of days ago, we had a representative from Microbiome Labs talking about the clinical benefits of the biome effects test, which is their stool test that uses the Cosmos ID technology, its entire genome, stool testing, sequencing, um, really promising uh, testing coming down the pipeline. And it's something that as the head of R&D that I'm I'm looking at um, as potentially a test to to introduce into the FDN community and something we're we're considering 
uh, onboarding onto the medical director program, potentially. Uh, you know, if we feel like it's a good fit, if there's good clinical correlation, and we have to do that vetting process, um, you know, not all tests are created equal, um, and not all tests necessarily give us additional healing opportunities. So um, that's why we designed or created this R&D department to help to vet these tests that come, come in, because there's always going to be new, new tests and new bells and whistles. Um, but we want, always want to make sure that we are using the, the best test that makes sense for our FDN community. And yeah, that's about it. Um, but yeah, if you're not an AFDNP, you guys, you're, you're missing out on all this, uh, all this amazing education. Amazing thing. I'm amazed at where it's, it's come from when Reed just had the kind of the idea for that, um, working through some of the beginnings of that and, and uh, starting to build it up to where it's uh, come to now. It's something, you know, it's something that I wish I had access to when I graduated 10 years ago. It would have sped things along. And again, just to have that community, I hear a lot, often from a verbal finals that people say, hey, I, one thing I love about this course is just the community. And it's not just a course you take and then you're done. You never think about, you know, FDN again or the organization, but you get to talk with you know staff along the way, with mentors. Um, you still stay connected with FDN, and we need that kind of support. You know, we can't know it all, and um, sometimes you know, hey, we all need a little bit of a, a pat on the back or a little bit of a boost and encouragement to remember what we're doing, and uh, you know, just keep the faith and 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 stay stay the course sometimes. So. You have that that uh, is an important thing as well. You know, we're not we're not all Superman or Superwoman. Uh, we still need some support uh, for sure. So, uh, awesome thing. So, be part of that. It's our that's our postgraduate arm. That's how you stay connected and grow and continue to improve in what you do through AFTMP. Okay. Well said. Well, good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, yes, everybody's focused on the conference. That's kind of the big things. But we do have some questions here we can go through. Um, I think we'll jump into those now. I've got several just yeah, pulled from different Facebook pages. And then also you guys that are there with us here today listening. Uh, I see several of you guys there. Thanks for spending your afternoon here with us, at least an hour of that afternoon. Um, if you want to ask a question, again, 347-637-1378. Hit one on the keypad, and I'll see you. And I'll bring you on. You can say, hey. All right, we'll jump into a question here. So um, this is a nice general one um, that I liked here from the trainee page here just recently. Um, question is, I'm using FGN to help people sleep better. Does anyone, I'm assuming that's kind of maybe their niche, right? Um, does anyone know why someone wouldn't get sleepy anymore? They feel exhausted or tired but not actually Sleepy. Well, I'll say this. I'll start with this. We can go lots of. We can probably talk for a couple hours on this, Brian. I would say as possibilities here. But um, I say overall to many people that I work with that if sleep is one of their main complaints, poor sleep, uh, poor quality sleep, can't fall asleep, can't stay asleep, um, sleeps too much. You know, that's also a thing too. You just can't get out of bed. Uh, invariably, working through the FDM process, sleep will get better. Because so mm -hmm. many different things influence sleep. It's not ever really, hardly ever just one thing. It's multiple things. And that's essentially at the heart of FDN is that we're a nonspecific, more general, multifaceted approach to, to bring and restore function in the body. And therefore, when the body functions better, we, we feel better. We're, we're, we're restoring health through that process. So that's why I say of the, as soon as somebody says they don't sleep well, about 10 different things popped to my head immediately of things that I would like to explore and say, hey, if we can work on maybe this, 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 lots of different things you think about. So this is just basically a natural outpouring of the FTM process to have better sleep. Um, so I think it's a good thing to, um, a safe thing to kind of marketing niche-wise yourself. Um, I, I don't know that maybe, Ryan, you can... Uh, disagree with this, maybe you have a different experience, but I don't know that I've ever had any client that maybe one in, in 10 years that their sleep did not improve, usually pretty dramatically through the process. So it's almost a guarantee, it seems like, that sleep will get better. Um, has that been your experience? Absolutely. Like you said, so long as they are following the process, they are adhering to dress protocols, 
and they're working through the hidden stressors that are coming up on their labs, uh, it's really hard to pinpoint one single variable as to why someone might be getting poor sleep because, like you said, it's it's a combination of factors between gut health and diet and nutrition. And, you know, even, uh, you know, exercise can come into play too, right? I've never seen somebody have a difficult time falling asleep after getting vigorous exercise that day. It just, it just doesn't happen, right? Like there, there's nothing better that can really just wear you out and, and, and help you conk out and fall asleep at night than, you know, getting a, a, a vigorous bout of exercise in during the day. Um, so that should never be un- underestimated. You know, it, it's, it's common to see people with sleep issues, trouble falling or staying asleep if they have low melatonin, right? That's like a, a classic FDN association that we see low melatonin associated with gut dysfunction. And that's because about 80% of melatonin is produced in the gut. So if we're seeing pathogens in there, dysbiosis, H. pylori, or other critters, as I know, Brandon, you like to call them, that that can disrupt the production of melatonin. Um, also, if we think of some like basic biochemistry, precursor to melatonin is serotonin. So we actually need to be getting serotonin uh, production going in the system to make melatonin. But if we take a step back even further, serotonin comes from tryptophan, uh, which we mostly get from carbohydrates, like healthy carbohydrates that are you know lower glycemic, squashes, beets, carrots, sweet potatoes, you know those sorts of things. So um, I've seen even some success with a small modification of having someone increase their carbohydrate content with dinner in the evening so that they're getting more tryptophan to support that melatonin pathway of making more melatonin in their system. Right? So there actually might be kind of some logic to the idea of, of dessert, right? That we typically have something kind of sweet uh, after dinner in the evening. I'm not saying anyone should go eat a box of Chips Ahoy cookies or a pint of ice cream, but just that there's a logic to um, getting some carbohydrates in the evening um, to help support melatonin and to help support sleep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the gut thing, you know, you think about the hormone route for things, you think about minerals, you think about, um, you know, caffeine consumption, maybe some kind of stimulants that are there that you're doing. So as you go through and work on, on diet, usually those things there, or just eating wrong for your metabolic type or food sensitivities, those things. So anything that one one yeah. possible cause of sleep disruption is any time that you have more cortisol, increased cortisol, um, any time throughout the night, right before bed, during the night sometime, or early morning, um, maybe that's blood sugar, maybe that's a food sensitivity. You know, those responses there to food sensitivities, those can be delayed by hours. So if you ate something at lunchtime, you think, well, how is that, could that actually be affecting my, how I feel at 2 in the morning? It's possible. So the delay could be hours or days. It doesn't have to be an immediate response. So, you know, can you actually identify how long it takes that person to have a response? Probably not. Not easily. You know, scientifically, maybe you could. But when it comes down to it, you're just going to have them pull out the sensitive foods. And then if that is a factor for that person that's no longer stimulating their system, cortisol drops, they sleep better, you can't always attribute 100% exactly what it is. Um, I think we like to do that maybe as a mental exercise or academic exercise. It's kind of cool. Um, but you've got, you know, direct connections like that. Um, and also you have just how everything is just all mixed together, right? So you've got not only, you know, direct clinical or direct correlation where, hey, maybe you, you know, had a cup of coffee at 5 in the afternoon. Well, that caffeine may be a direct reason why you can't go to sleep till 1 in the morning. You know, liver is not metabolizing that caffeine. You've stimulated the system. It's going to take a while to calm down. Uh, or mm-hmm. it could be a combination of things. It could be uh, partially the caffeine in that coffee, but maybe you have a sensitivity to that coffee, and that spikes up your immune system and also inflammation, and that's raising cortisol in addition to maybe adrenaline that's being raised by the, by the caffeine, and that's also triggering something else, so another cascade there, and then you get anxious because you are not falling asleep. You have a big day tomorrow, and you need your rest, 
So you start to feel anxious, so it releases more stress chemicals, which, you know, in turn, maybe damage your gut even further. So there's the cascades and there's the nuances of the interaction between it, and it's super complex, and nobody can figure it all out. You can't run enough labs or do enough tests or hook a person up to enough electrodes and, and monitoring equipment to know precisely everything going on. That's the beauty of this FTM process. We're just going to address all those things as best we possibly can and see if that will be enough to lower stress in the body to restore function. That's kind of FDN in a nutshell, and that's what you have to trust that overall process. So we're going to look at all those areas. We're going to support them as best we can over a period of a, of a few months, and good, better sleep is going to be an outcome from that. And then just like you have that kind of negative uh, snowball or, or bad uh, cascade that can happen from, a, from poor sleep, day after day, week after week, month after month, for some people year after year, well, you start to turn that ship around. And now we're going in the other direction of positive. So every single night that you have a good night's rest, what's that doing to your brain? What's that doing to your gut, your entire body? So that's the gift that keeps on giving with FDN once you go through and work with an FDN practitioner. Uh, I want my clients to continue to see improvement in their health, even though they're not actively working with me. Yeah, they might say, I'd like it, like us to keep talking because it keep me accountable and I feel encouraged. Um, there's some aspect of that, but the momentum and the things they've gotten moving in that positive direction um, generally will keep moving in that direction as long as they keep a good, you know, decent dress protocol going. Um, so I, I think um, sleep for this person, kind of thinking down that road, and um, I, I don't know if I've had any client either that hasn't listed sleep. Uh, or would like to see some improvement in sleep and some of their main complaints, so it's probably a pretty safe one there. Um, so I like the direction this is going here, so I think I go that way and just um, trust the FTM process to resolve things because I think you'll you'll find out why or the multiple reasons why that person just can't get their Zs. Very well said, Brandon. Yep, that that basically, like you said, kind of summarizes the essence of the FDN approach and process. It's all about addressing everything all at once, non-specifically, um, and, and not even getting too hung up on you know a specific reason why we're not getting good sleep or why there's even a certain symptom that we're experiencing on a regular basis. Uh, I explain this to clients all the time that that may seem counterintuitive. Uh, but we have to kind of change our thinking a little bit because it's a different paradigm to not get super focused on a particular label or diagnosis or symptom um, and start thinking about restoring the function of the body from the inside out, you know, at the cellular level, cell by cell, you know, restoring optimal function and letting the symptoms kind of uh, resolve themselves in a sense. Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool thing. So yeah. So and I, I'd well, say also in this, you know, you could fit a lot of things into this uh, blank here. So I'm using FDN to help people, whatever, have more energy or to lose weight or whatever you want to say. Uh, we get the question often, you know, can FDN help blank this condition, this diagnosis, this disorder, whatever? Um, yes, it probably can. You know, we don't do any, we don't treat doing anything specifically. We don't diagnose. We want to stay away from that for most of us as unlicensed practitioners, right? So we're in an area that we, we shouldn't be legally when we're getting too specific with things. But general health building, um, we can do that. And uh, it works very well. And also sometimes in, in conjunction with what they're doing already with their medical doctor. You know, we're not FDN doesn't replace a medical doctor or their doctor or prescriptions. That's not, that's not a contest. We're not trying to say, hey, you know, we can do it better than, than the doctor can. Um, we work with doctors. We want to have that good partnership um, where we're just looking at what's the best for that person, for that client. That person might need some a prescription for a while uh, or a longer amount of time. You know, there's just fundamental things that are broken in people's bodies that you just need some kind of support. So you want to minimize the damage of that kind of support, and we just try to optimize do the very best that we can uh, with that person's individual case, individual body chemistry, to get it functioning as best as possible, whatever that looks like. And that's where the biochemical individuality comes in. Each person is different. Each person's case is different. That's why on this call it is challenging sometimes to always give advice 
that's that's very specific um, uh, on a case because we don't know every nuance of that. You have to get and spend a lot of time telling about that person. Uh, but we still will attempt to give you some good gen- general principles. So don't uh, don't be afraid to call in with a, a question on your case. We'll do the best we can and kind of guide you there. But um, everybody's different, so. Um, it's 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 unique, uh, I guess, like a snowflake, right, or a fingerprint. Everybody's so unique in that way about how pe- people respond to this whole process. All right, well, hope that helps you there on the sleep side of things. Um, let's see. So I'll uh, about half an hour left in the call today, guys. So it's good to jump in with questions early, uh, especially if we get a, a caller that uh, maybe has a couple questions there. We could go a good 15 minutes um, answering some questions there. So if you do have a call. I want to call in and ask that question. I'd say do it as soon as you can. Hit one on the keypad, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Um, there's a few more here. I wanted to um, jump into here. Maybe some shorter ones here. Uh, okay. So let's talk about uh, food sensitivities real quick. And uh, this person oh, yeah. says, uh, my MRT came back sensitive to tapioca. Uh, does that mean I also need to avoid... Cassava, thanks. Um, mm-hmm. I would say yes. Yeah, right. I would say yes. Yeah. You, you, yeah, yeah, jump on that one there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, tapioca is derived from cassava. So, with food sensitivities, the immune system is reacting to the proteins in a given food. So, there is certainly going to be those those same proteins in the cassava as there would be the tapioca. If I'm not mistaken, I'm actually going to Google this while I'm talking. I'm pretty certain that tapioca is just cassava with some of the fiber removed. Um, it's something like that, the way that it's processed, but it's basically um, is cassava just with some processing done to it. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward. I would say that's a definite yes that both uh, if you're sensitive to either one, that you should avoid the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I think the overarching principle there is if something is well, similar to it or there's a, you know, a tight connection there, especially during the the initial uh, pulling out of the foods, uh, I think you go to a little different level. Like, for example, like with <laughs> nightshades. I've talked about this before. So let's say that green peppers and tomatoes comes up on the MRT or a food sensitivity test, you've got kind of the cousins of those, like white potato, eggplant, for example. It's probably a good idea to go ahead and remove those as well. So go ahead and take that extra step. Um, then if you really had to and couldn't live life uh, without those um, well, white potatoes, for example, well, maybe a little earlier than three months, you try to work them in a little bit and see what kind of response you get. Um, most people I know, they've, they've spent money on this test. They're looking for answers. We go ahead and pull it out because I want to know. Because if we don't pull it out, do we ever know if something was going to make a difference or not? Um, so sometimes you go to that next level. Um, so maybe you know a couple of things come up in the dairy section. Well, you know if it's cottage cheese and and cheddar cheese come up in the dairy section, I'm probably going to have that person go completely dairy free. Let's go ahead and pull all that dairy out. Um, let's see what the what we feel in the, from the body. And then you could work those things in later on. But I'm going to go ahead and take that next step. Or if I see, you know, three out of five gluten-containing grains coming up on the on the MRT, for example, well, you know, that's among other reasons why. I'd say that's a, uh, something on the side of the scale to go completely gluten-free and to go ahead and pull out every gluten-containing grain there. Um, or even if I've had a few people that just had one back here uh, recently that uh, every single grain except for oats – came back reactive. Well, you know, I'm glad we at least have oats, but I also thought, well, could this person just be really sensitive overall to grains? Happen to have blastocystis hominis, which can very much uh, go along with grain intolerance. So in our case, I said, I think grain-free is probably the best way to go. Let's go ahead and pull everything out, and then we'll see where things go after that. We can work some things in after things have calmed down a little bit. Um, you know, our, our goal is to, to get results for that person, and do the very best we can to restore function. And sometimes that means you give up some food that you don't like. Uh, we're not necessarily there to be their friend, necessarily. It's great if that happens, but they have hired you to do a job also. And so sometimes you've got to say, hey, yeah, I know it's hard to avoid corn or oats or whatever it is, but you told me you were committed to this process, and 
Let's give it some time. Let's give it a few weeks. Just give me two weeks, right? Just two weeks. You can do it. Pull those foods out, and let's see what happens. Very well said. Yeah, and Brandon, I, I looked it up just because I was curious. Oh, yeah. And tapioca is just the starch portion of cassava. Mm. So it basically removes all of the, all of the, a lot of the nutrients actually in the process, but all of the fiber too. Uh, so it's arguably not mm. as nearly as healthy as eating the full cassava root. Um, but I would still think there, there would be plenty of chance of those uh, same proteins and the cassava being left over in that, in that starch in the tapioca and, and therefore uh, presenting a, a potential for, for reactions. Um, so Yep, would definitely avoid it. I, I almost think of it mm. as the same same mechanism as uh, ghee, right, where ghee is derived from butter. And in the process of making ghee, it's actually heated up, and then all of the milk proteins rise to the top as kind of like this thick cream, um, and that all of those milk pre- proteins are removed from the, from the butter, and that what is left over is just the pure fat. Um, so what's interesting there is I have seen people with, with and this includes myself, um, oftentimes people that have a sensitivity to dairy um, can do well with ghee because the proteins that you might be reactive to have been removed. But you still want to be careful because there, even if there's trace amounts of those proteins left over, uh, that can present a risk for uh, a sensitivity or a, re- or a reaction, especially in someone who who's, you know, um, who's maybe super sensitive or, or needs to do some work to kind of build a more robust immune system and, and restore some oral tolerance and, and, to, and to restore their secretory IgA levels, heal intestinal permeability. You know, all those sorts of things can actually help uh, potentially minimize food sensitivity reactions, you know, by working through the dress process and uh, especially with healing the gut. Mm-hmm. Well, it's uh, it's critical. I think a food sensitivity test uh, of some sort. There's you have some choices on that. Um, that's uh, a foundation of what we do. That's part of the whole the diet aspect. You've got to have some information there to know what your body's reacting to because it's it's very hard to tell. Uh, like we talked about, mm-hmm. mentioned earlier, responses, food responses are delayed. Um, or it's a food that you would think is totally benign and healthful and everybody's, it's good for everybody. You know, I'm going to eat chicken or avocado or whatever, could blueberries, whatever. It's like, oh, it's a superfood. Everybody should eat it, kale, whatever you're, you want to put in there. Um, and that person, your, your body, it could be an issue for you right now. So knowing that is amazing and it saves you a ton of time. So you, if you could isolate each one of those foods and kind of listen to your body, um, they take you forever to test, you know, 100 foods plus on a lot of these labs. Um, they take you forever to do that. You just, you almost couldn't that, couldn't. And then also all the complicating variables like we talked about, how one thing can affect something else. So um, those food sensitivity tests are really, I think, one of the best values, uh, I would say, as far as lab mm-hmm. testing goes on far-reaching effect. Um, so always excited to get to go over the MRT and then our food sensitivity test and, see what happens over the next few weeks and get that and kind of check in in a couple of weeks to say, hey, how's it going? You know, how are you feeling with those foods out of there? Wow. And like half their, half their problems are starting to resolve. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Food is, uh, it could be, you know, food can be medicine or it can be poison. Yeah, you know, to your point, Brandon, I right before this call, I went over a food sensitivity panel with a client and she was sensitive to ginger and cinnamon and apples. I mean, you know, uh, I think carrots is actually one that came up. So, you know, they're not necessarily things that you would think of as the more, the more common, you know, the top five food allergens that we think of tend to be wheat and dairy, eggs, uh, nuts Mm -hmm. and seeds, peanuts, those sorts of sorts of things that, that might even trigger uh, legitimate food allergies. Um, But this is an important distinction too here between uh, food allergies, which which can be life threatening, and food sensitivities, which can present you know an ongoing source of inflammation. Uh, but because these can be delayed reactions with food sensitivities, uh, we might not necessarily um, be able to track them very well on our own. 
if we're reacting to cinnamon, um, and that's something we had three days ago in an apple crisp or something, uh, then, you know, we would have no idea really uh, that that cinnamon was causing a, a migraine three days later or a change in bowel movement or whatever symptom it might present as. Uh, and that's why testing without guessing is, is so valuable uh, because it, it can help you to, uh, you know, really get some concrete data without um, um, trying to guess on your own, you know, what might be causing these types of reactions. And it could be this sort of low-grade inflammation that you're not even aware is happening when, when these food sensitivities are going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so that can really help you to kind of reset the clock and, and get some information that you can act on and eliminate those foods for two or three months or so and then try to challenge those by, by reintroducing them one at a time. But um, one way I often explain it is that, you know, you're reducing another source or another uh, vector of, of inflammation when you can identify those food sensitivities and remove them. And knowing that, you know, inflammation in general is at the root of so many different chronic health conditions and symptoms, as FDMs, we're always looking to reduce as many possible sources of inflammation or, or, or hidden stressors in the body. You know, like, like you said earlier, a, a food sensitivity could be spiking cortisol, right, in the, in the evening, and that could be preventing you from having optimal sleep, right? Because when your cortisol is elevated in the evening, you're basically in fight or flight. You're in alert mode. And so that cortisol response is telling your body to stay awake and basically to, to uh, keep an eye out for predators, right? In a sense, when your cortisol is elevated. Um, and so something as seemingly benign as these like, you know, innocuous foods like, like apples or cinnamon or or whatever it might be that come up on a sensi- uh, food sensitivity panel could be perpetuating these issues without you realizing it, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, can be powerful yeah. stuff, can be life-changing stuff to, to have that information. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind, as an FDM practitioner, one of the things you're doing, and this can actually be something that you can remind your clients, even on your onboarding call, is that you're you're compressing time. So... And that's in every way, right? So people have people want health issues resolved, and they are maybe putting a lot of energy forth trying to make that happen. But if they just do it on their own, it's going to take forever, and it's probably still not going to be as good of a job. So it's kind of like for me, I don't. I wish I was a better builder. I love to, you know, add on to our house or a deck or something like that. Well, my know-how and mm-hmm. skill. Uh, with that, it's going to take me a lot longer. It's probably going to be a really crummy job where instead I could just hire somebody that can compress time and do a lot better job than what I would do. Uh, so that's part of what we're doing as practitioners. We're, co- we're, we're compressing time, all that energy and effort. You can laser focus that instead of just a wide beam. It's laser focused. Those results get faster. And I think it's, I think you're saying that, Ryan, about the um, being able to yeah. know exactly what's going on immediately. I always think about the time compression thing. Uh, hopefully time is valuable. I think I maybe talked about this last week. Uh, hopefully time is valuable to you uh, and valuable to your clients. So um, if we can do anything to speed the process up, um, and, you know, we all want results quick. Who doesn't want quick results? One of the quickest results you're going to see uh, is pulling out food sensitivities. I, I once heard someone, I'm not going to get this analogy 100% accurate, but I heard a practitioner once say that when you're hiring a a skilled functional practitioner, it's it's not like you're just hiring a carpenter with a hammer to hit some nails. You know, they, they've got years of knowledge of how to know exactly how to use that hammer at, at, at the exact right time in the exact right place, right? To, to you know, and, and if you do it yourself, like you said, if you don't have that kind of skill set, you're probably going to mess something up. You're going to have to rip the drywall off. You're going to have to go back to Lowe's and buy more more caulking and more, more tools and more nails, right? Because you're, you're probably going to make a bunch of mistakes. So, you know, when you're hiring a, an expert to help you, it's, it's, you're hiring them for, for their, not just for their time, but for the precision, right? Because they know, they know to look at your entire health history and look at your labs and know exactly where to start to, to hit that first nail in, in the right place, to create the right 
change in your biochemistry, right? Um, so if you're hiring an, an experienced functional practitioner, hiring an experienced FDN, you know, you know, consider that they've got years of, of experience under their belt and have attended conferences and, and invested in training, right? Um, and have, have a, a, lot, a lot of knowledge in the back of their mind. I could tell you one thing, I would never want someone to hire me to, to come and try to fix their house or build an additional room. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I joke all the time, I can't fix houses, but I can fix bodies. Um, mm. And that's definitely yep. the realm I intend to stay in, right? I would much rather hire some contractors to come when, I, when there's something that needs to be fixed in the house. And, you know, I recognize that same skill set in them, that they've, they've got a lot of years and experience under their belt. Um, I'm not even going to try to mess with that. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'll just watch them do their job, watch them work. <laughs> That's right. All right. So 20 minutes left in the call, guys. Um, Don't be afraid, guys. Question. Yep. Don't be afraid. That's probably a good time to jump in with the question if you have it. But if you don't, just listening and hopefully it's helpful. Um, like you're saying, Ryan, there, you know, got a lot of experienced FTM practitioners, invested a lot. They probably endured a few of these Friday calls, gone back years, and and uh, spent a lot of time listening to people talk and some of these concepts. And it's good stuff. It's good stuff. That's where I started. And that's one of the first things I dove into um, were these Friday calls back in you know, 2010 uh, or so, um, 2009, actually. Um into these Friday calls and getting into those and listening back all the way and, and hearing people talk about these principles and these concepts. And that's how it gets into you because we've been, we've had a lot of years, unfortunately, of, of brainwashing in some of the other directions, more of a medical mindset, more of a reductionistic mindset, a lot of myths and, and, and you know, just things that aren't true uh, about the body that we've been taught. Some of the things have to be unlearned. And it's as much as you've watched pharmaceutical commercials or ER or whatever, whatever you've watched that kind of gets you thinking the medical mindset and uh, some of how the body actually doesn't work, or somebody that's you know has a product to sell. A lot of time has been spent there. A lot of programming has gone in. That's kind of how it's all designed. That's that's marketing, right? So getting you to think a certain way. Um, it takes some time to kind of wash some of that out, and uh, you have a balance. You don't throw everything away. You need to understand that the medical system or anti-medical, but Listening to those calls like this, listening to the, the principles, the analogies being laid out, the experience there, it does something for you. It changes the way that you think, and you have those great responses. You know what to do. That's how you become experienced. So keep tuning in. Go back and listen to the archives. These are all recorded and archived back years. So you can go back and, and do a search there. If you guys don't know that, on FTN Connect, do a little search there. And one of the searches, whatever topic you look for, when that search result comes up, you will see some Friday calls that um, pertain usually to what we're, you're asking about. So it's a good place to get some information. We usually have some pretty good show notes in there so you know what we covered and when. So use this as a resource also. Go back and listen to these calls. All right, let's see yep. here. Um, hey, maybe on a, uh, there's another question I've had on my list for a little while. It's sort of similar to the tapioca one, so let's maybe talk about it too so I can – I can finally mark it off here. Um, so this question is, if I have a sensitivity to cow's milk and beef, would it be wise to consider using Livitrate? I believe it's from Happy Cows. Uh, what about adrenal trait products? So um, hmm. so pro- products here they're referring to are more on the glandular side. So um, free-stride liver, uh, bovine liver, so cow liver, uh, free-stride uh, adrenal gland from cow. So... Um, so if you have a problem with milk and with, with beef, would bovine glandulars be a problem or a consideration maybe that you would want to avoid or find an alternative to when it comes to supplementation? Yeah. What do you think, Brian? I've got my opinion. Yeah, so I, I think that's a pretty similar question to the previous one. If I'm not mistaken, we got a, a pretty similar question like that last week, too. I think about taking like organ meat capsules or something like if you had a sensitivity to beef. So I would think, yeah, same, same deal there. You know, if you've got a, a, a sensitivity to, to a beef protein or, um, 
something similar along those lines, I, I would I would be avoiding any kind of uh, glandulars that are bovine derived. Is that is that kind of what the question is getting at? It is, yeah. Maybe, maybe you guys had yeah. last week. I didn't yeah. get marked off the list there. So yeah, so this kind of the concept there. Sure. Um, that's what they're looking at. So I'd say I would agree with that. I'd say you know you could go with another animal um, product, another sure. uh, protein source that you know is okay. Um, or you know, there's multiple ways to do this. There's Yes, yeah. But you've got herbs, you've got amino acids, you've got all sorts of things you can use to support um, adrenal or HPA axis dysfunction, liver function. You're not limited to those. They're very great things to use. I think those are super powerful. Uh, we don't utilize enough of, of animals that are harvested. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think it's, that's always a, another principle here. Whenever you're working with somebody, you need to factor in their MRT into your recommendations when it comes to supplements. So the food sensitivities, if they are reactive to the foods, you want to be aware of that. It doesn't mean you uh, do 100% always. Sometimes the good outweighs the bad. We get that question very often. So, you know, we've got somebody that has a sensitivity to garlic, and you've got some garlic and biocidin. Okay, do you not use biocidin, um, the hard and fast line? Do you go ahead and try it? Do you use it? Um, it's going to be a little different for each person, but I think you have to weigh it and say, well, does the, does the good outweigh the bad? So could the benefit of knocking out some organisms and supporting the gut with biocidin, would that in turn make the gut healthier, improve oral tolerance, and the the garlic becomes a non-issue? Mm, I kind of think that's yeah, yeah. You know, considering biocidin has like 17 different ingredients in there, garlic's a small part of that, you might say that, but something that's kind of obvious like this where you're saying, okay, this is a glandular product, it's a fairly large amount, this probably isn't the best thing for them. So just be aware of, of their, the foods that do bother a person um, when you're looking at their protocol. Yeah, such a good point. I had a, that same client I mentioned earlier on her food sensitivity panel, black walnut came up, and I'm pretty certain that's in biocidin. But I'm, total, I'm in total agreement there that uh, you have to kind of take the good with the bad. And that's one of 17 herbs, like you said, in that formula so, you know, the, the chances that are going to cause a serious reaction, you know, it, is it possible? Yeah. Um, maybe would you want to titrate a little more carefully and start with a very low dose in that case, just to be sure there's no potential adverse reactions? Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, that might be a cause to just take it a little easier. But I, I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as the, as the expression goes in that case. I don't even know what that expression means. I mean, where that came from. <laughs> it's actually kind of strange when you think about it. Um, I but, think I know, but uh, I'll, look that, I'll try. I'll have to look it up. Hopefully it's not something too weird. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, kind of same idea there. Like, you know, in this case, she she also had a signs of, of candida overgrowth and a lot of aspergillus mold, too, on her oat test. So, you know, chances are that that biocidin is going to have a lot more benefit than it would be um, a drawback or, or a source of inflammation. And, and in restoring the health of the gut and eradicating pathogens and, and in the biofilm disrupting properties of the biocidin, you know, in that process, you know, that's going to help restore immune tolerance and that's going to help to, to minimize in the long run um, food sensitivity reactions. So, so I'm not necessarily one of those that's in the camp that if there's one thing on that's on a food sensitivity test of, of one item of those 17 herbs and biocidin, I'm not necessarily going to um, withhold that from the protocol. I'm just going to, we're just going to kind of keep that in mind um, in case there are any uh, noticeable adverse reactions or, or really severe Herx reactions. Um, but in my experience, I haven't had any problem using it uh, when someone does have a sensitivity to one of those herbs, um, so long as we're, you know, also working holistically, working on implementing dress protocols, uh, you know, also throwing in a binder in there to minimize die-off reactions and help kind of mop up the, the toxins and the, and the dying pathogens that are, you know, resulting from the antimicrobials. Um, so uh, get, I'm getting a little long-winded here, but um, yeah, kind of just saying the same thing here that, that, uh, you know, we have to take the good with the bad sometimes and make some judgment calls, right? 
um, about what's going to produce um, the, the greatest benefit for that individual um, and not, not hyper scrutinizing too often with like looking at um, some of those minutia, right? We always want to keep the big picture in mind. Yes. Very, very good point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, baby out with the bathwater. I think I want to say this was going back. This is Trump random too, talking about you know rambling on. But I think that it went back to uh, I think when you know running water maybe was an issue years ago, and a uh, whole family would bathe maybe once a week. And uh, I think usually it was like the father would go first, and then you know mother, and then the rest of the children. So the baby would be the last one to bathe, and you know by the time you bathe you know, three, four, five, six, whatever, ten people, that water might be pretty nasty. And so um, the hmm. idea is that you would throw the water out that's dirty, and because it's so dirty, you didn't see the baby in there, so you throw the baby out with the, with the bath water. So <laughs> um, kind of silly kind of thing, okay. but it makes, that, I think yeah, it makes, that makes sense. sense. So, And there might be five other, you know, if you Google it, five other origins there uh, of that, but... The idea is that you don't want to throw out something uh, very good with something uh, bad. So parsing that effectively is is part of what we do uh, when it comes to the body. And, and so it's kind go. of another way too of saying you know not to get lost in the in the trees, right? To to step back and look at the yeah. forest, right? It kind of yes. Don't don't what is it? Don't don't mistake the forest for the trees. Is that the expression? Yes, they're exactly. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. All those things, and those are, it may seem uh, obvious to some people, but those are some of the challenges we come up against um, as far as mentoring, um, as far as, you know, even verbal final conversations. We just, we all have our, our, coming into the course, we all have our ways that we look at things and the ways our mind works and the questions that we ask, and um, sometimes you've got to change thinking just a little bit, you know, and kind of let go of some things a little bit and, and trust in some way. So, um and we all have our, our bins and our ways that we like to, to look at things and focus on. And, you know, FDN doesn't uh, take over your life and monopolize everything, but we want to get you thinking out the right way because ultimately it comes down to, to satisfaction in what you're doing and uh, results for your clients. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, well, eight-minute eight, eight warning here uh, on the call. So um, last, last call for questions, I would say. Um, I see some of you guys out there listening, so thanks for joining us again. And just a reminder, we won't have a call next Friday. So uh, mm, hopefully right. instead of listening to, to us, you'll be listening to some aspect of the of the FDN conference. I know I can't remember exactly when it starts on Friday, but um, maybe you'll be listening to somebody else at that time, so you'll still be FDN-focused, but that may not be us. All right, mm-hmm. so let's see here. Um, there's a couple here. Well, hey, we're on, since we're on the food sensitivity side, and, and Ryan, you kind of talked about this. So, um, person said, "Hey, I just got my results back on my MRT lab test. I didn't realize it didn't catch allergies like IgE. Do we have a test for that, or would that be referred to an allergist?" Um, so, yeah, good, good thing here. So, this is uh, another good principle: is that you need to know how what the method of testing is the advantages the limitations of any lab you run for a person so we should know our labs you don't have to know exactly you know the machine how it works but the basic principles and the practical things that you would of why you would run that lab what you're going to get from that lab that's something that you should know as a practitioner hands down um uh, so this is a trainee, so we'll we'll say, hey, now we're still learning. But you need to know what's going on and, what again, what the limitations are of the lab testing. There is no perfect uh, all-inclusive food sensitivity test. Uh, I think they're all great. They all have some somewhat of a level of limitations, right? So typically what we're looking for are more are not IgE reactions. That's truly are like an allergic response that's a, usually a quick, usually a repeatable um, you can usually identify pretty easily those type of responses. Um, there may be a test you can do for that through the, FD, through the medical director program. I don't think so, but there might be. But that's usually in the realm right, of an allergist. So you're going to do some kind of allergy test. And, and having that information, I think, can be helpful. Right? So if there's something yep. that you truly can avoid, we'll do it. But so many times with a test like that... Um, you have two problems, I think, with that. One of them is that some of those things are actually almost totally unavoidable. 
like you, you, you would be cleaning uh, yourself to death to try to remove every single particle or something that could, you could have a reaction to. Now, foods, that can be very good, right? We don't want to have an anaphylactic shock or a big situation there. But sometimes things like dust mites or animal dander or some kind of plant or something like that, you may not be able to really remove that so much from your environment. Um, so there's limitations that way. Um, I think the other thing that people tend to want to do is just say, I, I need to uh, avoid those, those uh, allergens uh, or get some kind of allergy shot or something to turn off the response to that. When ideally, I think we try to go a little bit further, you know, but I guess there are life, life um, uh, threatening situations, of course, EpiPens and things like that. And, and if people need to do what's you know, safe because it can be a, a major situation, I'm not saying you should be totally um, ignorant to that. But um, we would say, well, why is that person having a reaction like that? What is eliciting that mm-hmm. response? That's always the question, right? So are there some things within what we do with FDN that can improve uh, or you know, tamp down a little bit or balance out immune system response where that becomes not an issue for anymore for that person? Potentially so. So I think that's the bigger question. That's what a lot of my clients deal with. They've had some kind of testing done. They know they have some reactions to things but they're having trouble avoiding those. So I get to come in and do is try to support that body in all the different ways that we do that. And could that eventually um, help balance out that immune system where it's not hyper-responsive to that particular allergen anymore? Yeah, very, I think it's very possible. Um, I've seen that you know, many times. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so know what you're testing. Know the limitations. Um, know how that factors into everything else, what you're doing. But... Now, we're looking at more delayed responses, different immune pathways um, with that test, and most of the tests we offer through the medical director program for food sensitivity testing. So let's leave uh, IgE um, up to the, the allergist. Mm, yep. Yeah, that's something, too, that's usually fairly easy to get run on insurance. I had just True. my my general practitioner run a, run a food allergy panel for me years ago. I think it was probably about eight years ago. And I had IgE allergies to dairy and to peanuts and to shellfish. Um, you know, all, all of those are very common. Um, but yeah, that's something usually you can get run through a general practitioner, if not, like you mentioned, an allergist. Uh, but that can be valuable, valuable information to have as well. Uh, but, but also with like you had mentioned, since those IgE food allergy reactions are typically more pronounced and more immediate, um, usually you you usually you know when you have a food allergy, right? Um, mm-hmm. And those do uh, tend to be pretty pronounced reactions. So um, it's something that, um, in most cases, I would I would argue uh, people might be pretty aware of. Like every time they consume oysters, their throat closes up, or they might have a similar reaction to peanuts or something like that. Not to say it's always going to be that severe, but it, but it can be a little more obvious than, than food sensitivities, right? Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, so is that something that if you have that knowledge, you don't necessarily need to run a test to confirm it, right? Because you're probably not going to want to, uh, you know, eat pe- keep eating peanuts and keep having your throat closing up or going into anaphylaxis, uh, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Super. Okay. So yeah. kind of our theme yeah. a little bit is the <laughs> is the food sensitivity. So yeah. um all right. Let's see. I'm looking to see the time. We're running short here, so we may uh we have to call it a call it a call here. But uh so yeah, so hopefully that some of these principles that we've laid down here are helpful to you and write those down, commit those to memory and just becomes part of, of how you work and um you know, those principles will guide you. That's why we're uh, mm-hmm. Very general too in the principle side of things. So uh, apply the principles, and most of the time they're going to be effective, and you're going to get where you need. All right. Well, hey, we'll say congratulations then to our four graduates, Abigail, Melanie, Nina, and Caitlin here this week. So congrats. Awesome job. Cool stuff. And thanks for the written in, written in questions, guys. Hopefully we are again helpful to you there. And again, no Friday call next week because we'll be. Uh, doing the FGN conference, functional health coaching conference, and it's going to be a blast. So um, we'll talk to you guys the week after, and uh, we'll resume our calls then at that point. And uh, Ryan, man, I'll, I'll see you in uh, less than a week. Can't wait to see you in San Diego. It's going to be fun. 
Gonna be. Sounds good. We'll hit the beach. Talk to you then. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome.